Okay. Um, and then uh, here's my development machine window with PyCharm in it. Um, where we were last time was we were almost completely done with Lab 2, except that uh, um, I was refactoring the join method code for adding two um, categories together. And so inside of category, I was implementing overriding the under under um, add under under method, which is what handles plus. And uh, um, so here, here it is. Um, and then I was having a problem because it wasn't throwing exceptions properly. And the actual code that it was um, executing was something like this. Let me see if I can just undo those changes. Nope, can't, but I can move it back to where it was. So basically this code, I had this inside of the try, like so. So it was looking up the new name. So the name is constructed by adding the name of the first category followed by a slash followed by the name of the second category. And then it looks up to see whether there's a category with that name. And if there is, then we want to throw an exception because there's already a category with that name and we don't want to create a new one and then have two of them. Um, and so what I did to figure out what was going on was I actually put a breakpoint right there and then ran the program. Actually, I'm sorry, I meant to run this under the debugger. So let me try that one more time. So I'm going to run this under the debugger and then I'm going to um, print the list of categories, which I think is P, was it? Uh, um, actually, L for print the list of categories. And then, um, so I, I'm going to join um, entertainment and school. So join school and entertainment. And then this one should be fine. So I'm going to step over. And uh, actually, I want to get rid of these. Let me get rid of those. Um, and then continue. OK, so now if I do L, I should have my new school slash entertainment category. So this time, if I do a join, I should run into that breakpoint. So I'm going to join school to entertainment. And now I'm stopped at the breakpoint. So it's going to, if I hover over new name, it's school slash entertainment. And if I step over that line of code and then hover over new category, I see it's a new category or it found the category school entertainment. So that means it already exists. So I get to the next line, which should raise an exception. So I'm going to step over that. But you'll notice that the accept catches that exception because I didn't put a type here. So there's two ways of fixing that. The first way of fixing it is I only want to catch the exception if I get a key error on this line of code. So this line of code is going to call lookup, which is going to take the new name and use it as the key in a dictionary. And then if it's not actually in the dictionary, lookup is going to raise an exception. So if I don't want to, if I want to catch that exception, I accept here. So now if I try it, I'm going to go ahead and rerun this code. So let me stop the code. And then, um, all right, so rerun it. So I'm going to J school entertainment, and that one should work. And then L, and it's there. So I'm going to J school entertainment. So this time I got the error, which is what I wanted that says that it already exists. So the fix was to only catch key errors here. Um, and then the other way to fix this, which is what I actually did in the code that I checked into 
um, GitHub is I moved these two lines after the catch. So like so. So if I catch, so if I get an error on this lookup here, then I'm going to catch it. And it could be any kind of error. So if I get any kind of error from this lookup, then I'm going to um, just set new category um, to none. And then if new cat and, and actually, that's not exactly what I had. What, what, what do I do here? Um, actually, I think I want to raise it inside of here. Yeah, anyways, I'm going to do it the other way. Yeah. Um, uh, let me, uh, so let me show you a cool trick. I'm going to go ahead and start git bash here, and I'm going to navigate into my project folder. And then git status. So I see the only difference between what I have in my current project and what's in the repository is this file here. And I could do git diff, and this shows me the actual differences between the two files. So what I had before was I have, if new category is not none, then raise the exception inside the accept clause instead of inside of the try. So that's what I checked into the Git repository. This version, though, has the if statement inside of the, uh, or I'm sorry, actually, this is the one it had. So it had, if new category is not none after this except. And uh, so this sets the category, this lookup here. Here, I'm going to do this again. So what I have in the Git repository is this. So if lookup um, works, then new category is going to be set to the matching category. I'm going to skip this accept clause here, and then I'm going to get to that piece of code, which says that um, if it's not none, which it isn't, then it's going to raise an exception. Otherwise, if there's a key error, it sets new category to none, it skips this line, and then gets to the next line. So either way is going to fix the problem. Um, any questions on that? OK, I, I might have been the only one who actually cared about that. But, uh, um, but it's a good illustration of the debugging process, I think, and also the fact that there's multiple ways of fixing this. Um, this time, though, I actually think I like it better having this up here. And then catching the cure instead of the exception. All right. Um, and then I screwed up the indentation on that. All right. So let me just run this one more time, make sure it still works, and I didn't break anything. And then if it works, I'm going to move on to MongoDB. So we're going to join School to Entertainment. And then join school to entertainment. And this time we get an exception because it already exists. All right. Um, any questions on anything on lab two? OK, so I'm going to go ahead and get status, git add dot git commit dash m um, change implementation for catching exception when join category exists. All right, and then git push. And so that's on the repository. Um, OK, so let's move on to MongoDB. So um, I think most of you, or at least some of you, I, actually, I think all of you have either completed 275 or are currently taking it now um, because it's a uh, prereq slash co-rec for this course. And so you're probably halfway through the course right now, so you've learned probably everything there is to know about select statements and about tables and rows and fetching data out of 
databases and you're probably starting to look at data modeling now. So um, in 275, you're using a program called a database server called Microsoft SQL Server. And then you're using probably either SQL Server Management Studio or Data Grip or something like that to connect to the database and to run queries. So um, the characteristics of uh, a, a, of a database server like Microsoft SQL Server is um, it's called a relational database because information is stored in tables. And relation is basically a fancy term that uh, uh, mathematicians use to talk about tables. They mean the same thing. Um, relation is a more formal mathematical concept and table is an actual implementation in a database. But basically um, SQL Server and other popular database um, servers like Oracle and Ingress and DB2 and so on um, are relational databases because they store data in tables and almost universally they support a SQL front end structured query language where you can send a text-based query to the database and you get back um, rows of results in the form of a temporary table, essentially. Um, what we're gonna be looking at in MongoDB is a little different. So instead of organizing data into rows in a table, MongoDB organizes documents in a collection. So you can think of a row as being similar to a document. So a row is a particular instance of a, of a table or a class. For example, you might have a table for um, account and there might be a column for um, website name and a column for username and a column for password and a column for URL and a column for last date of password changed and so on. So that's how you would represent accounts in a table. Um, and then if you also wanted to represent two-factor accounts, what you could do is one of two things. Either you could have a separate table for two-factor accounts that had the same information as a table has, plus type and info, um, or you could make a table that just has an ID, which matches the ID and account, and then two additional columns, one for type or info. Um, but basically, you would have all of the data organized into tables. In a document-oriented database like MongoDB, instead what you have is basically a dictionary. So instead of a row of data with a specific set of values that are organized in a sequence, and like the third value is always the URL and the fifth value is always the password and so on. Instead of that sort of rigid way of handling data, what we do in MongoDB is we just store a dictionary in a MongoDB collection um, and then we read it back out and we get a dictionary back. And dictionaries are just like they are in Python where you can basically have um, any key value you want can hold any property value you want. And the only real exception, the only real restrictions on that um, are that some of the more advanced data types in uh, Python um, are a little bit more than MongoDB can handle. So you can store dictionaries that have other dictionaries inside of them and other lists inside of them and so on. Um, but you can't really store objects of a particular class. So for example, if I have a list of account objects, I might want to store all of those accounts in a MongoDB collection, which is just the term that MongoDB uses for a list of accounts, which is like a table. So instead of a table holding rows, a collection holds documents. So I might want to store a list of accounts in a MongoDB collection, um, but I can't actually store a list of objects. I have to store a list of dictionaries. So the way I typically do that is I have a method on each object called to dictionary. And when I call that method on an object, I get a dictionary back. And then I can take a list of objects and turn it into a list of dictionaries, store the list of dictionaries into MongoDB. 
And then when I want to read the data out of MongoDB, I sort of do the opposite. So I get a list of dictionaries out of MongoDB. I go through each dictionary in the list, and I call a build method on the class that takes a dictionary and turns it into an object of that class. So I end up with a list of accounts. Um, and that's going to look a fair amount like, uh, well, we'll see what it looks like when we, when we get to there. So um, actually using MongoDB is going to turn out to be simpler than if you were using relational database because we don't have to go through structured query language. And uh, but we do have some work cut out for us. So any questions? That was sort of a quick overview of what we're going to try to accomplish um, this week. So any questions on anything I said? Good. OK. Um, so in terms of terminology, I said that uh, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, Server and Oracle were relational databases, and they used SQL. MongoDB is a document-oriented database. And collectively, there's a bunch of different kinds of databases that aren't relational and that don't use structured query language. And sort of as a marketing term, there's a collective um, for all of those kinds of databases that are not SQL relational databases. So collectively, as a marketing term, we can call them NoSQL databases um, because typically they don't have a SQL front end and they're not relational. Um, but, uh, but there are some things that look an awful lot like SQL databases, which are considered NoSQL databases for fairly technical reasons. And it's really kind of more of a marketing term, I think, than a technical term. And there's also a bunch of fundamentally different kinds of NoSQL databases. So we're going to be using MongoDB, which is an object or a document-oriented um, NoSQL database. But there's others that hold graphs and relationships and then... Um, sharded data that can be easily spread over tens of thousands of machines. And they all solve different kinds of problems. But MongoDB is one of the more popular NoSQL databases. And so that's what we're going to use here. Um, and another nice thing about MongoDB that we're going to take advantage of in this class um, is that you can basically get a free virtual server cluster in the cloud on the internet where your database is running, which lets you connect to it anywhere that you have a an internet connection. So if you want to write an app, you can actually run that app on multiple different machines that are all using the same database on the internet. Um, and at their lowest tier of service, which is more than what we'll need for this class, it's completely free. So a great way to get practice with not only NoSQL databases, but also get some experience working with something that's running in the cloud. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and start by pulling up my browser. And uh, I'm going to go to mongodb.com. And uh, here's the home page and lots of stuff on here. Feel free to look around on your time. Um, but I'm just going to go right to the login. So um, first thing you want to do is you want to make an account. And I'm going to click on the sign in. There's probably a link off of there for making a new account. So you have a bunch of options. You can sign up um, and then you can sign up using an existing Google account or GitHub account. Um, and I've actually, I've shown this process multiple times of creating accounts. And so I actually have multiple accounts on MongoDB right now. And I can never remember which account is holding which databases. So I think, I think that I need to log in here with my pcc.edu account, but I guess we'll find out. Um, and then uh, this is always a challenge as well. Um, let's see. And then stairs. I hate these things more than I can tell you. Like this one right here. Is that a stair there? I can't even see. It's small and blurry and ugly. Um, uh, <laughs> I guess that's it. I don't know. All right. So that wasn't the valid. That wasn't the right one. Let's try this one. 
if this, uh, oops, that wasn't it here. Okay, let's try this one. Um, I think that didn't work. Um, I'm just going to try one other one. That one worked. Hey, it only took me three tries. How about that? Um, okay. Um, so nowadays, it wants me to use multi-factor authentication, um, but I'll set that up later. Um, and then... Uh, I just thought I said later. Hmm. Is it not letting me skip that? Okay, let me go back one and let me try that again. Um, I clicked the wrong button. I meant to click remind me later and I click set up now. So that was my fault. Um, okay, so I've already been here before. So I already have some databases and some uh, um, virtual server instances in the cloud. Um, but the first time you log in, it's going to give you a window where you can create um, a new um, database. So um, I think I can go to, uh, here, let me see what I want. Let me go to database and uh, create. Okay, so you have some options. So what you want is uh, actually, a minimal configuration required for serverless. Um, and then let's, I think this is what you want, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay, so um, this is, once again, this is going to be a server instance that's running in the cloud, um, and it runs on top of multiple different cloud providers. So basically, um, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, and uh, uh, Microsoft Azure um, are all um, software as a service providers, and, uh, and MongoDB runs on top of them. So you get to pick the one that you want um, if you really care. Um, I actually don't care, so AWS is fine with me. Um, we have, uh, uh, if you're a member of the CIS department, a student or an instructor, we have um, Azure Dev Tools for teaching, and you can sign up for that for free, and that will give you a certain number of hours of cloud time if you want to use it for Azure development or anything like that. Um, but I'm not going to worry about any of that. I'm just going to take the defaults. Um, for this one, the default works perfectly fine, but I'm going to select Oregon because, I don't know, I'm probably, I'm under the probably mistaken illusion that it's a little faster if it's geographically closer. Um, and then uh, additional settings, snapshots are taken every six hours. You can switch backup plans at any time. Um, and there's a serverless continuous backup, which is not free. Um, I'm going to go for basic backup, which is free. Um, and then when enabled, prevent any user from accidentally deleting this cluster. Termination protection will need to be disabled. I'm not going to deal with that. I'm just later on, I'm going to keep my credentials hidden. Um, so instance name, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, let's do bookmark manager. Um, actually, it can only contain ASCII letters, numbers, and hyphens. So we'll do bookmark manager without an underscore. Um, and then I don't need keys or values. I don't need, I don't need tags. And then I'm going to create the instance. So this is a little different from what I did in the video, but I think it's going to be fine for us. Um, well, we'll see in a second. So serverless instance, configuration details. Um, I actually wanted the free one, so I think I have to go for the other one. Um, on the previous page, on the yeah top of the far right, instead of the serverless, the shared one is yeah. free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll go shared. Um, the setup's pretty much similar. Um, so we'll just do Oregon. 
Um, and then cluster tier M0 sandbox, that's the lowest tier of service. You get half a gigabyte of storage in the database and uh, basically three, a cluster of three virtual machines. And uh, free forever, that's what we like to see. Um, so M0 is the lowest tier. And then if you need more storage or you need more connect or other kinds of services, there's M2 for two gigabytes for nine bucks a month and M5 for five gigabytes at 25 per month. Um, additional settings, I'm not gonna turn on backup. I'm not gonna turn on termination pr protection. And then cluster details, this one I'm gonna call my cluster bookmark manager. Um, and then no tags and uh, actually, I think I'm missing something. Uh, use tags efficiently labeled and categorize your clusters. No, I don't need that. Um, I a uh, project already has a free cluster. So if I hadn't already made my free cluster, this create cluster would be enabled, but since I already have a cluster, it only lets you do one free cluster per account. Um, you can have as many collections as you want inside of your MongoDB database. So it's possible to use the same database for multiple projects with no problem, um, but this is a limitation. So, um, so pretend that this next bit worked. Um, one of the things that I would get on a later screen is uh, database access and network access. So this network access, you're gonna see this on like the next page or the page after that. This one's kind of important because it uh, basically says what machines on the internet are allowed to connect to your MongoDB server. And if you want it to be maximally secure, then you list the minimum number of possible machines. Um, but this isn't necessarily a practical solution for you unless you have a static IP address. And you probably only have a static IP address if you have a higher tier commercial account. So for example, um, I have the lowest tier of Comcast business class internet, and I pay about a hundred bucks a month, give or take for it. Um, and the only real advantage it has over a personal account is that I get a static IP address. And since I have that static IP address, I can say only my machine is allowed to connect to the databases that I wanna keep private. Um, but if you're on dial-up or cable modem or most you know, non-professional, um, non-business um, hosting solutions, then you probably have what's known as dynamic IP allocation. And depending on your service, it could be every time you connect or every two weeks or so, you probably get bumped out of your current IP address and move to a different one. And if that's the case and your old IP address was set as the only IP address that can access MongoDB, then you're basically gonna find yourself locked out of your own database, um, which is kind of a pain. So um, first thing you wanna do, if you want, you can find out your IP address by saying something like, um, look up my IP address in Google. And uh, I don't wanna find it in Windows. What is my IP address? That's a good one. So I'll click on that. And, uh, and actually this one isn't that, hang on. No, that's not what I want. Um, what is my IP address? Let me try that one. There it is. Okay. So here's my IPv6 IP address, and here's my IPv4 IP address. So this is actually the IP address that I um, that I pay Comcast to maintain. And if you have your own IP address, you can um, you can register domain names and. Um, configure name service lookup so that everybody who accesses your site will get referred to this IP address. So for example, um, I have a, a domain name for glassbirder.com, which I have 
um, just the default homepage for Apache, um, but I have some services that are running under here in a way that is not actually very easy to discover. So, um, and we'll talk about that more towards the end of the class when we get to the Flask stuff. So anyways, that's how you can find out what your IP address currently is if you wanted to use that here, but I don't recommend it. So what I recommend, since this is extremely low security and not all that important, is go ahead and edit this. And then if you want to let anybody talk to your database, any IP address, which is probably the most convenient if you have dynamic IP or you want to access it from school and work and the library and other places, just use 0 .0 .0 .0. Um, And that's basically shorthand for anybody can access your database. And I should have changed this to anybody. OK, so well, that's going to spin for a while and do its thing. Um, I am going to edit that, though, and change my IP address to everyone. Um, but you should do that um, because it's important that you are able to access your site from various places. And also, um, you should give me access to it. Um, but for mine, I actually, this particular account, I actually have some stuff on here that I want to keep private. Um, so I am going to restrict access to my database, not for this project, not for the bookmark manager, but for some other stuff that I have on this particular account. All right, um, so any questions on any of that? Okay, good. Um, so after you've gone through the rest of the steps, the default's gonna work on most of the rest of the stuff. You're gonna be somewhere like this page. So you'll be, now there's two things on this page. One of them's obvious and the other's a little less obvious. So the thing that's obvious is here's your database deployments and it includes a bunch of buttons on here, which are really handy. And we'll look at those in a minute. Um, also includes this information. So which version of MongoDB you're running, which, um, you know, which service you're hosted on, your servers are hosted on, your tier support level, um, you're using three nodes and um, there's replication strategies across all the different nodes that you're using, um, backup policy, link services, um, and then some other buttons, which we don't really need. Um, so that's the obvious part. And then the part that's a little less obvious is if you go to the top here and you click on this drop down, um, what you can actually subscribe to multiple organizations. And then under each organization, you can have a different set of databases. So if you decide to take some of the tutorials on MongoDB, then um, you can create a MongoDB University organization and then um, make copies of the sample databases that they provide with you um, to take tutorials and things. And some of them are really interesting. Um, I have my real stuff on this Portland Community College. Um, and so I just clicked on that. It's showing me that I have two separate projects on this one. There's the project zero, which is default. And then here's my actual schedule data um, which I think I showed you like in week one of this little scheduling program. Um, uh, here's the database backend for that. And it's the primary reason that I've secured the connection to this database. Okay, so you need to make sure that you're, if you have multiple organizations, which you want to start, first you select your organization. Um, and then you can either select the database here, um, go to schedule, um, and uh, that will take you back to this page. Um, and it has some, some buttons on here. So you can browse collections. The um, scheduler program has three collections. And once again, collections are like tables and documents are like rows. But for example, if I want to look at the courses collection, here's the first 20 documents in the courses collection. And this is not usable right now. <laughs> so let me uh, um, 
Yeah, uh, this is not ideal for a uh, um, low resolution desktop. And so I'm going to try zooming out so that a little bit more text will fit on the screen. But hopefully that's still readable. So at least I can see two at a time. So this is what a document looks like. And as I said before, it's basically a dictionary. So a document in the courses collection has um, this one special underscore ID is a special one that MongoDB requires. It's basically a key value. And we'll see how we can use this in a, in a while. If you store a document in a collection and you don't specify a key value, um, MongoDB will automatically generate a new unique key, which is basically 32 bytes of random data um, that it uses to identify this. Um, I am using the course prefix and number joined together as my key for courses. So this is just like in your account manager, password manager program, um, you'll be using um, the website and your username as the key for accessing accounts. Um, I'm using prefix and number as my key for accessing courses. Um, and then title is the title of the course, credits is four, and then pretty much all of these documents have the same stuff in them, just different course numbers, descriptions, and IDs. Um, and then if you look at instructors, um, so that has like instructor IDs on that. So I'm probably going to skip that one for now. I'll go to sections though, because I think sections, yeah, I might, hmm, yeah, it's fine for now. Okay. So yeah, so here's an example of a section. Yeah, it has IDs in it, so I'm not going to look at it. And then that has IDs in it too. Okay, um, but it's the same kind of stuff. You have dictionaries with named properties and values. Um, so does everybody sort of have like a vague idea of the kind of data that's stored in a collection? Um, I have any one. questions? Yeah, yeah I have one question to wrap my head around that a bit because I use a lot of data frames in my work. Um, mm -hmm. For this, with the the column name is kind of the key, and then mm -hmm. the data for that row is the value, and then yes. each row is a dictionary. Yes. Okay, cool. The only difference is that, like, if I want to stick additional properties on any of these guys, the rest of them don't have to have them. So with a column, mm -hmm. like prefix, okay. if prefix was a column, every single document in the collection has to have prefix. But for this one, like in your program, you have two-factor accounts as well as accounts. If you want to have info and type on your two-factor accounts, but you don't want to have them on your regular accounts, you can do that in MongoDB because you're not restricted as to what properties you can put on each document. Okay, sweet. Yeah, that makes sense. Good. Any other questions? All right. Um, so uh, here's where we were before. And this is what you'll see after you've created your first um, MongoDB cluster. Um, and then um, the next step is this connect button. So we're going to click on the connect button and we get a pop up. And uh, this is the thing that lets you connect. This is information that will be useful for you if you want to connect your database from Python. So um, I'm going to go ahead and open drivers and uh, uh, MongoDB is like um, radically cross-platform, supports a bunch of different languages. And uh, so the first step here is tell MongoDB what language you want to use to connect to your MongoDB cluster. And you have all these choices. Um, and there's probably some additional ones that aren't on this list, but we're going to pick Python. Um, and then it wants to know what version of Python you're using. Um, which may or not have any kind of uh, impact on exactly the suggestions it uses. But right now I'm using 3.12 on this machine. So I'm going to say 3.12 or later. Um, and then it's telling me the next step, which is I need to do um, this command. And so I'm going to copy that and uh, pop up a command shell. Now, this one, this is a little tricky because on my development machine, I actually have 
um, Python installed um, under uh, my administrator account for everybody. So I think for me personally, I'm going to need to run this as administrator. You won't have to do this, but I do have to do it. Um, and then there's the command and I execute it. And so this got installed into my system Python, which is actually in program files. So for you, your Python is going to be in users, your username, um, and then there's app data, local programs, Python. If you have your Python installed for individual use by default, you'll have a Python and then a Python 3.12 or Python 3.11. And then inside of that, there'll be a libs folder. And somewhere inside of the libs folder is where PyMongo is going to go. Um, but for my computer, because I installed it as an administrator for everybody, because it's Windows Server, it's which is I'm getting used to, um, it actually ends up in program files, Python 3.12, um, and then there's a libs folder under here, and somewhere under there is going to be PyMongo, or maybe it's under scripts, and it's somewhere, it's somewhere in there. Probably libs. No, no I'm not going to look for it. Um, so anyways, that's where it is. And then um, going back here. Should I do the update? Mine also has the update thing on it there. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so some of the packages get a little out of date in terms of the contents. And usually it's not a big deal, but it um, doesn't hurt as long as I'm here. I'm just going to go ahead and execute that thing. And that will update my pip inventory of packages. Um, yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Any other questions? OK. So that's the driver that we need for Python for 3.12. And you're probably going to get almost the, this one's actually, so sometimes it has the server requirement and the server requirement basically means it also installs a package called DNS Python, um, which it needs in some versions of PyMongo. Okay, and then the next thing is add connection string to your application code. Um, and then uh, you can just get the connection string or you can view the code sample, which is kind of handy. So let's look at the code sample and see, this is what you need to know in order to connect to a MongoDB database. Um, so inside PyMongo, there is a Mongo client um, and a server API. Um, and that's more complicated than what you need. But the bottom line is you have this uh, connection string that we had right above there. Um, and then here's the thing, the main thing you need is this call to um, the constructor for a Mongo client. And uh, you give it the connection string. Um, and there are some parameters that you can specify. The main difference in this version of MongoDB from what you'll see in the videos is uh, before you just passed in the connection string, some options at the end. So it would say like, this here is an option that you supply. Um, in this version of Mon MongoDB, you can specify a server API object, which tells you what level of API you want to use. Um, and then uh, either way, it's going to return a MongoDB connection client object. Um, and then, then it just has basically something just to make sure that it actually works. So it tries a ping command, but we don't need that. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to grab this code here. And I'm going to go to my PyCharm and stop the program that's running. And then I already have a database.py file, which has my read data method in it, um, which returns my list of bookmarks and categories. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and make a uh, connect method, which is a class method. So when I want to connect to the MongoDB database, I'm going to call the connect method. And then um, this 
these two lines go at the top. So my imports are at the top. And then my connection string is fine there. Uh, my call to Mongo client is fine. It's going to return a connection, which it calls client, but I'm going to actually store it as the class property on the database class. And uh, I'm using double underscores for name angling. So I'll do under under client is equal to none. And then in connect, I only want to execute this code if I haven't already connected to the database. So I'm going to say if CLS dot under under client is none, that means I have not connected yet. So I'm going to do those things. Um, otherwise, I don't do anything because I'm already connected and I don't have to do anything. Um, so that connects to the database. And then um, in order to test this out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some test code to the bottom here so that if I run database as a script, it's going to run my test code. So I can figure out whether this is running as a script or whether it's being imported by using that line of code right there. So this is the module name. And if you, if I was to like say Python space database.py and run this as a script, the module name gets set to this piece of text. It's just hardwired to do that. Whereas if I import this database.py into another file, the module name is actually going to be database. So if this is true, that means I'm running this as a script so I can run my test code. And so what I'm going to do is uh, call database.connect and then print database dot under under client. Um, but this won't actually work because of name mangling. Um, and so what I'm going to do instead for now is say database under under client because that will actually work. So let's go ahead and run it and see what it does. Um, and actually that didn't work. So I'm going to put a breakpoint on this line. And actually, let's print client here. I think you need to change the password in the URI. Oh, uh, yep, 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 yep. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, hmm. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't actually, this is, I, I need to switch to my other account where I actually have databases that people can connect to. Um, so that I think was probably my GitHub account. So let me, sorry for the delay. I'm going to log out of here um, if I can figure out how to log out of my account. Hang on. Okay. Let me regroup for a second here. Uh, do I have, yes, log out. Here it is. Okay, so let me try logging in. Is it my Google account or my GitHub account? Let's try this one first. Hmm. Yeah, that's not it, probably. Okay, let me try from my Google account. Okay, so let's see what I have for databases here. No, that's the same account. Okay, so that's not what I want here. Let me try one more time. Okay, let's do uh, Comcast. Hmm.
Hopefully I can do this without actually having to watch the video. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so remind me later for multi-factor authentication. And then if you already have an account, it just takes you directly to this page. Um, and then from the database tab, um, so I have a shows database. So this is one that anybody can connect to. And, uh, um, and I had a show manager last time. Um, so, uh, um, yeah. So let me click on shows and, uh, and go to connection. Um, so password for this. Um, anyways, the account is Mark Goodman. Um, password I actually have in a different project. So let me go ahead and um, open a project. I'm going to go to my, um, let's see. Here. course instructors so i'm going to go to the course instructors project and open that in a new window and that will have the credentials that i need um so in database.py um so here are the credentials that i was using before and uh, just ci user for course instructors, and the password is just CI user 233Y. And then here's the cluster name. And so let me go ahead and just grab this part here and uh, go over to this other project. And I'm going to go ahead and paste that in. All the way up to the slash. OK. So now, now it should work. So let's go ahead and try it. Um, uh, DNS query name does not exist. TCP. So let me actually grab that whole connection string. I think this might be a version incompatibility as well because this is getting a little older now. Um, MongoDB SRV. Yeah. Hmm. What happens if I actually run this thing here? Specify. Um, actually, it's probably a good time for a break anyhow while I sort of sort this out. Um, so it's 154. And uh let's get back together at 205. And I promise not to change anything um until 205, but I am gonna try to figure out. Um, exactly which database I should be using because I have too many of them right now. Um, any questions while I work on that? So, Mark, I had a question. There's a tutorial mm -hmm. on introducing the introduction to working with MongoDB and PyMongo. Mm -hmm. Are we to follow that? Because it doesn't seem exactly like where you're going. Um, well, there's a couple of minor differences in terms of the connection string, and so either one of them should work. Everything past this point is going to be pretty vanilla. Okay. I mean, well, I'm going to follow the same basic. So, I mean, what I'm going to do is I already have some dummy data, and so I'm going to store it in MongoDB as a collection um, and then implement code that reads it back out of MongoDB and recreates. So it's going to be list of bookmarks and list of categories um, and goes to list of dictionaries and list of dictionaries, goes into MongoDB, um, two separate collections, and then comes back out of MongoDB as list of dictionaries and then gets turned into list of um, categories and list of bookmarks. And that's going to be exactly the same in this version as in the other version. Well, not exactly the same because it's never exactly the same every time I write it. But did you have a specific thing that you were concerned about being different? 
Well, just you're moving things through for me at least very fast, and uh, uh, yeah. and I, I'd rather look at something in writing and walk through it slowly and um, and make sure I don't uh, mess things up. So that's why I was just asking: is the tutorial that's printed um, and attached to our this week's lesson uh, valid, or do I need to make some modifications and? and well, the tutorial, I mean, if you're talking about, yeah, so let's look at the tutorial. So the, um, let me, uh, yeah. I mean, are you, if you're, you're talking about the readings instead of the videos, right? Right. So, so, so the readings have everything you will ever want. It's the full reference to MongoDB, which also means it includes a lot of stuff that you don't need. Got it. Okay. So, so yeah, everything you need is in there, but a whole bunch more. And probably the stuff you need is at most 10% of what is in the documentation. So my advice is to either follow along the videos that are already in the weekly lessons or follow along with the recording of this session, which is going to be under the um, the recordings tab under the Zoom tab. Okay, uh, I'll follow the, this week's session and, and yeah. you want to look at it again. Yeah, actually... and, okay. and, then, and then when you're doing that, if I do something and you don't know, understand what I did, or you want more information on what I did, um, then it's good to take that back to the MongoDB reference material. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think I think it's time to come back anyhow. Um, so um, I did figure out how to look up my password. I couldn't find my password in any of my files because I made it secure and to use environment. And when you make something secure and then you move on to a new machine, it sometimes becomes difficult to locate stuff. So anyways, you can access your user accounts through this database access tab in, when you're signed into uh, MongoDB. Um, this basic, by, by the way, the cloud version of this is called Atlas. Um, so Atlas is the um, infrastructure for running your MongoDB database in the cloud. Um, and then, um, I, I was able to recover the password here, but I didn't want to let that one get into the wild. And so what I ended up doing was I made a new user. So to make a new user that has access to this database, you can click add new database user, um, select the method of authentication. I used password um, and then um, type the username and the password for the user or generate an automatically to automatically generate a secure password, either one. And then once you've done that, you can set the role. Um, I set the role to be um, read and write to any database for this account, and then click the add user button. Um, so that gave me the username, which was show user, and the password that I created, which is also show user. And, uh, and then I added those to the URI for accessing my MongoDB database. So the rest of this stuff is pretty much just like what I had before. Um, the only difference is that I supplied um, different account information. And then it's this is connecting to my, um, actually it's connecting to my server um, instance and getting a client connection and then printing it. So when I run the code, what I get is this thing here. So it prints. So this is an object of type Mongo client, and its custom print string is Mongo client open print. And then the host is actually the uh, name of the so-called um, shard, which is a set of servers, and then port number. So that's basically the host where my database lives in the cloud. Um, and then it's a collection of three of those. So three virtual hosts in the cloud, each with different um, host names. And then document classes, dicks, um, and then some other flags that you can adjust, but usually the default is fine on all of those. Um, and then 
also which version of the API I'm using to talk to MongoDB, which is what I specified in this store. Okay, so I have a connection here, and this is actually a little tiny bit simpler, I think, than what's in the example file, but not significantly so. It's basically the same thing. Um, so any questions? Anybody have any questions on that part? Okay, so the way it works is first you open a connection to the client, which is a client object. Then you access a database that's on the client server. So um, the way you do that, it looks like an array reference or a dictionary reference. So you say, for example, if I wanna have a new database for bookmarks, I can say something like um, bookmarks, database is equal to client square bracket bookmarks like so so and you can also use dot notation that also works so you can either treat it like a dictionary or you can treat it like an object so this is basically we learned a little bit about dunder methods and operator overloading this dot thing is actually an operator and when you say like object dot um, some property name, it looks up the value of this property by default. But the MongoDB designers who implemented this particular driver, they overrode dot so that it does something a little special, which is if there's a database running on the server with this particular name, it returns that database just like it was a property. But if there is no database with this name running on the server, um, it makes a brand new one. And so this will actually create a new bookmarks database that's inside of my database server. Um, and then once you have a database, you can also make um, collections. And so I'm going to have a uh, bookmarks collection, which is equal to bookmarks database dot bookmarks and i'm also going to have a categories connect collection which is bookmarks database dot categories and here too this is operator overloading so if i don't have a database name that it makes one and inside that database, if I don't have a collection name that, it makes one, and then it makes one of those two. Um, and then the convention I've been following is since is uh, to go ahead and name the collections using uppercase, using upper camel case. And so to be consistent with that, I'm going to do it here too. But then this is going to return an object, and this is going to return an object, and this is going to return an object. And so I'm storing those objects in variables. So bookmarks database is a variable that holds a bookmarks database object. This is um, a variable that holds a collection object and same here. Um, and then I'm just gonna go ahead and print those things so you can see what they look like. So we're gonna print bookmarks database and bookmarks collection and bookmarks categories, actually categories collection. So let's run it and see what we get. And actually, I, and I'm going to get rid of the, I have an extra print statement down here. Get rid of that. OK, so databases look like this. This is actually the connection to the database. Um, and then here's a collection under the database. And if you go to the end, you can see um, this is my bookmarks database. This is my bookmarks collection. This is my categories collection. And then, oh, and, and I printed my client at the end after those things. So that's a little awkward. So let me uh, let me change that. I should print these in the order that I make them, because otherwise it's a little confusing. 
Okay, so there's my, actually, I'm gonna be done with the other print statements. All right, so there's my client, my database, and my two collections. Client, database, two collections. Um, and then the only thing that I really am gonna need for the rest of this program are these two collections. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add properties on my database class for um, bookmarks, collection and categories collection. And then here, I'm gonna go ahead and set cls.bookmarks collection is bookmarks collection and cls.categories collection is categories collection. Quite sure why it didn't make a suggestion on that one, but anyways, um, so that's going to connect to the database, um, and then um, right now they're empty. So uh, what I want to do is I want to actually put some documents in them. So I'm going to make a new class method that's going to create a set of documents um, and add them to my MongoDB collections. Any questions on this so far, and what I'm going to do next? Um, do you need to uh, set the collections to that uh, transient variable before assigning it to the class variable? No. No. Um, and in fact, I will go ahead and not do that. Yeah, you can set them directly there, and then you just print them from here as well. Actually, this is CLS, I'm sorry. Because it's a class method, so it takes CLS. So this should work exactly the same. Um, and uh, there. Hmm. Let me try that one more time here. Um, did I run out of threads? Can't create new thread at interpreter shutdown. Um, I'm going to put a breakpoint on this thing and then step through it and try to figure out what I did wrong there. Okay, so I have my client is good, my database is good, cls.bookmarks collection is good. Um, and then cls.categories collection is good. And then I'm printing client. I'm printing database, printing CLS bookmarks collection, which is right there, and then printing categories collection. So I got a problem when I tried to print the categories collection. Did I spell something wrong? CLS categories collection. So I'm going to copy that. And change that. And it works now. So obviously, I had some kind of typo here. And let me undo for a sec. Collection. Hmm. Okay, so there's here. Okay, so when I run into this, I'm actually not seeing what the difference is. So let me go ahead and uh, actually just put them right next to each other. Wow, those look really similar to me.
Okay, now it's not working. Okay, um, I think I have some other issue going on here. No, it's printing the collections, so it's not there that I'm having the trouble. So let me actually step through. It must be after that that I'm getting the problem. So blip, 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 and then print, 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 print. Now I'm back here. It printed all this stuff. It's probably because I'm not actually closing the connection. I didn't actually need to before. But so it it works when I run it under the debugger. And then step over that. Yeah, so it prints this stuff, but then when it goes to exit, I have a problem. Okay, so let me try uh let me add a close method here. I didn't used to have to close these things. And that's going to take a CLS. So I need to make sure that the client gets stored and it does. So we're going to do under under client. Uh, close. Let me double check that actually. Hang on. So my Mongo is a driver. See something in chat. Um, if you don't close the connection, does it continue to use resources in your database? It shouldn't. When the Python executable exits, it's supposed to close all open connections um, unless they change that behavior, which I don't know why they would. Um, yeah, client.close. Okay. Yep, yeah, you're welcome. I mean, I'm probably doing something really obvious and stupid and just not seeing it. Um, that's often the case. But I'm sure we've all been there. Okay, and then I'm going to call my close method at the end here. Oh, it's close connection. Okay, runtime error can't create new thread and interpreter shutdown. So let me, uh, it's, this is a threading issue and I suspect it might be because I'm running, something is messed up, but I won't worry about it because I can actually connect to the database right now. I don't think you will have this problem though on your machines. Um, so, so I'm just gonna continue for now, um, but, uh, but I will post something after class. Um, and then, so I have my connection, I have my collections, um, I have a method that dummies up some data, um, and I'm going to make a new class method called rebuild data. And um, first thing it's going to do is it's going to call read data and it's going to get all bookmarks in all categories. So all bookmarks, all categories is equal to CLS.read data. And then um, this all bookmarks I can ignore because it's already in this list of categories here. And so if I do something with the entire list of categories, I will also have done it for the list of bookmarks. So what I'm going to do is for category in all categories, 
I'm going to print it category just so that I can see what it looks like. And then in order to use that, I'm going to call database dot read data. And then I haven't mentioned it before, but my design for this is going to be every time I call one of these methods that is going to talk to the database, I'm going to call cls.connect. Um, and then if it's the first time I'm actually running a method that talks to the database, it will go ahead and make the connection. But if it's the second or subsequent time, I'll already have the connection. And so it's just going to reuse it. And we'll see that again in a minute. Um, but the bottom line here is that I don't have to call this. And so let's go ahead and run it. And then I'm going to ignore the errors at the end. Let me uh, put a breakpoint on here and uh, run it under the debugger. So I'm not actually getting there. So this database read data. Oh, I didn't want read data. I want rebuild data. OK, so now I'm going to run it. All right, and then scroll above the errors. So there they are. OK, so I have my connections and collections, and I have my categories. So what I'm going to do for this list of categories is instead of printing it, I'm going to turn it into a list of dictionaries that I can store in MongoDB. So here's my list of dictionaries. Put the breakpoint. I have the breakpoint already. So here's my list of dictionaries for category. Actually, continue. OK, so here's my list of categories. And then I want to turn this list of categories into a list of um, dictionaries. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the map method, which we talked about briefly when we did higher order functions. So, um, and then I'm going to call that category, category dicts is equal to, and there's a couple of different ways of doing this. Actually, I'm going to do a list comprehension. So what this is going to return is a new list where each item in the list is a category dot to dict. So each category is going to have a to dict method that takes the category object and turns it into a dictionary. And then I'm going to do that for each dict, for each category in all categories, like so. So this will take my list of categories and turn it into a list of dictionaries. And then in order to do that, I need to implement this to dict method on category. So I go to category and uh, towards the top, you see the constructor. So it has name, description, and bookmarks. And then I'm actually going to add this at the bottom here. And it's going to be uh, just a regular method called to dict. And it's going to return a dictionary. And uh, name is going to be cell dot under under name. Just double check that. So I have name, description, and bookmarks. And then description is going to be self dot under under description. And then bookmarks. So this one, this one's a little tiny bit tricky because my bookmarks are actually objects. And I can't store an object in MongoDB collection. So I need to convert the bookmarks into something that I actually can store. Now I could convert each of the bookmarks here into a separate dictionary. That would be perfectly fine and have a list of dictionaries here for the bookmarks. But then let's say I have a bookmark that's in multiple categories. 
I would be making a separate dictionary for each um, each copy of the bookmark and all of the different um, categories that it was in, which is not really what I want. So what I'm going to do instead is similar to what I would do with a relational database. Instead of storing the bookmark here, list of bookmarks, I'm going to store a list of keys. And then when I read this data back in, I can look up the key to find the bookmark that matches it. So what this is going to be, I'm going to put a list comprehension here. I'm going to return um, bookmark that get key for bookmark in um, and then self dot under under bookmarks. So it's going to go through each bookmark in the list of bookmarks one at a time. It's going to get the key for that bookmark. It's going to make a new list of keys, which are all going to be strings. And then that's what's going to be in the dictionary. So now I need to make sure that bookmarks have get key values. So let's look at site. And uh, what I'm using for the key is basically this thing right here. So the URL in all lowercase is the key, and it's what I'm using to look things up in the map. And so I'm going to make an explicit key function, get key. So that looks like any other accessor, but what it's going to return is actually going to be self dot under under url dot lower so it's not going to return the original url it'll return it in all lower case and then here um i could actually call get key if i wanted to do that so self dot get key so and then everywhere where i have uh, self dot under under url dot lower like here i'm well, this one I can't because this is a class method. I don't have an object that I can call um, get key off of, so I will just do this instead. Okay, so that should be everything to get my list of dictionaries. So I'm going to go back to my database here. I still have this breakpoint, and I'm going to run it on, up to the breakpoint. Um, let me stop it first and then run it under the debugger. Okay, so now I got to my breakpoint. I have my category dicts. If I open it, it's a list of dictionaries. And each dictionary has a bookmarks property, which is a list of URLs in all lowercase that I can use as key values to look up bookmarks. And then it's got a description, where which I, is what I hard coded in the description. And it's got a name. So search engine, school, finance, entertainment, and so on. So now this list of dictionaries I can store right in MongoDB. And so let's do that. So, um, and I'm going to use the MongoDB insert method. So MongoDB, you take a collection like CLS dot under under categories collection. And actually, it's already doing it. It's inserting many category dicts. OK, so I knew what I wanted. So what this is going to do, I usually just use insert instead of insert many. I think it does the same thing. So what this does is it takes a list of dictionaries, inserts it into a collection. And then I'm going to run this. So stop it. And I'm just going to run this whole thing. OK, and I got the same bug on exit. But now if I go to my um, database here, is this the right one? I think this is the right one. Let's look at the database shows. Actually, do I? Hmm. Um, database browse collections bookmarks, categories, and then I have users from before. Um, so this is, I'm sorry. Uh, so this was actually a MongoDB database that I was using for essentially the same program in Node.js. And so this is not the stuff that I just added. Um, 
which is probably under a different account. Okay, so this is the problem I was having before is that I have too many accounts and I'm not sure which is which. Um, so I'm in the shows database still. And my collection name is bookmarks. So let me go to the shows database. Shows. I'm in shows. Okay, browsing collections. Yeah, um, I think it's not actually saving it, which is probably why I'm getting that error on close. So I think I probably will have to figure out what that error on close is here. Cannot imp well, that's not the right one, anyhow. Um, so, exception in thread PyMongo server monitor thread. And then let me add the actual error message here as well. I mean, usually the right answer at this point is to downgrade to um, Python 3.11 or some previous version that's known to work. Runtime error can't create new threaded interpreter shutdown. So this is exactly the problem I'm having, probably. New ticket. Cause of the issue is that MongoDB starts a new thread for each monitored server in the cluster. If the client is created directly before the application ex exits, then threads will attempt to start up during the Python interpreter shutdown. Did not used to be an issue in Python, but was changed in Python 3.12. So as I just said, if I was using Python 3.11, I probably wouldn't see this issue. So um, quick and dirty, because I want to be as fast as possible for this. I'm going to go to python.org, and I'm going to download and install 3.11. So here's 3.11. Uh, I want 3.11.7 download. I have a question. Yes, please. Is it pretty common to flip it back, like flip back and forth between the different like Python versions? Yes, unfortunately, one of the downsides of Python, one of the, the great thing about Python is there's so much user contributed code and libraries, but the downside of that is nobody's really writing herd and uh, often, often new versions of stuff get released that are incompatible with other new versions of stuff and stuff breaks. And so if you've ever wondered why there's an env folder in your Python project by default, um, it's because the actual versions of libraries that you may need to keep your program working may be older versions and specific versions of different libraries. So it's quite it's quite common that you might have one set of libraries for one project and a different different versions of the same libraries for a different project depending on what other libraries are also part of your project. And and that's unfortunate but you get used to it a little bit. Okay, so anyways, I'm sorry. I wanted the uh, Windows 64 bit installer for that. And, uh, well, I mean, I warned you, I think that I was doing something stupid when I said I was going to try 3.12 and see if it worked or not. And so this is the penalty 
that I got for doing that. And then on this machine, which is running Windows Server Data Center, I need to actually run this as administrator or it will not work. Um, and then I want to use a custom installation and uh, um, actually I cannot do for all users. But I just run that as a user. Let me try that one more time. Okay, so run as administrator. There's no password. Um, and then, hmm, interestingly, when I installed 3.12, I could actually check this box to install it for all users, but I don't seem to be able to do that here. Um, so, well, I will add it to the path, though, and I'll just do install now. Okay, um, and then I'm going to go to, actually, I'm going to make a new command shell to, and do Python dash dash version. So it's still seeing the 312. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to edit my system environment variables. So that it sees 3.11 instead. Um, so my user, my administrator path um, has 3.11 on it, which is fine. Um, but my system path has 3.12 in the program files directory. So I'm going to kill that reference, delete, delete. And then I'm going to copy this thing and add it to the system path. And uh, move it up to the top. And then I also want to, so that was the scripts folder. And I also want to add just up to Python 3.11. Okay, so now there are videos on doing that as well, but hopefully with any luck, you won't need them. Good, so it's finding the 3.11 that I just installed. So now I'm gonna to go to PyCharm and uh, go to my file settings. Python interpreter, switch, add interpreter, local interpreter, and then existing. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not administrator, and it's in the administrator account. So hmm, will this work? So if our PyCharm still shows 3.11 as an interpreter option, yeah. can we just switch it to that? Yeah, you should be fine. Okay. You should be fine if you do that. If you do run into trouble, let me know, though. But I've definitely used that with 3.11 um, without getting this particular error. And the fact that I just found something that said it was a 3.12 problem, um, I'm inclined to believe that it's a 3.12 problem. So... C users mark app data um, local programs Python. Oh, it's actually it's not mark, it's an administrator. That may be an issue. Let me uh let me try one of the let me try running it as myself here. Yeah, so, okay. All right, I don't want to change my policies. So um, that's why I ended up installing it for everybody before. Um, so 
I might need to give myself permission to this app data local programs. Python 3.11, python.exe. Um, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that this will actually work. And then I need to do pip install pymongo plus SRV, or is it just SRV? Okay, something actually worked for once. <laughs> you know, you get to a certain point in this kind of process where things are going wrong and you just hope something will work. Um, so let's go ahead and try running this and see if it works. And it did. Okay, so now um, I'm going to go to my database and reload this page. And uh, actually, let me go back to database. Shows. Actually, let me go to shows browse collections. OK, so still not, oh, because bookmarks. I should have a bookmarks collection. Um. Anyways, let me try. Um, the other side of this, which is going to be reading the data, um, because I think that's about all I really have time for. So I'm going to do class method, three categories, which is all I have right now. Um, and it's going to call connect. And then I'm going to do categories. This is it right here. So what this is doing is it's getting my categories collection on my class and then calling find. And then find by default is going to return all of the documents in the collection. There's ways of specifying I only want certain documents that match a query. I only want certain columns and so on. But for this, this is what I want right now. And I'm going to print that. So what this should print is a list of dictionaries. And if I run it, actually, I need to go to here. I'm going to comment out that rebuild data. And I'm going to get rid of the close because I don't need it anymore. And I'm going to call read categories. And hopefully, I should have, I think, two copies two copies of each category. So let's see. Oh, um, and then this thing is a cursor and basically um, it's an iterable. And if I wanna turn it into a list, I can wrap that in list. So run it again. Oh, it's not, it's, oh, um, not here. I need to do that where I have my categories. So. So right here, I'm going to print list. Actually, I'll do it here. I'll say this is list of that. OK. Um, and uh, not quite there yet, because it returned an empty collection. So I have to figure out why my categories didn't get saved. Did I call? Did I actually call the thing that did the insert? Rebuild data gets the list of categories. Um, let's do the insert many instead. Let's try that. So I'm going to call database rebuild categories, and then I'm going to call database read categories. And there they are. OK, so let me just do this one more time, and then I'll let you go. So I'm going to run this under the debugger so that we can see what I got back. So I'll put a breakpoint on the print statement here. And uh, here's my dictionaries that I'm putting in the collection. And then here I'm printing the categories. So I'm going to open that up. 
and uh, what you see is a list of dictionaries. So um, PyMongo added this ID property because I didn't specify it. I, so I need to fix my to dict method to include the key value, which is going to be the name in all lowercase um, as a property. And I'll do that first part next week. Um, and then there's a bookmarks property, which is the list of URLs. And I need to turn that into a list of category or bookmarks. And then the description, which is text and the name, which is text. So it's getting everything. And then if you look carefully, you will notice that I have a list of categories with search engines and then another list of categories with search engines. And I have two copies. And the reason I have two copies is every time I call this rebuild data method right here, it's making the list of dictionaries and it's adding it to the collection, but it's not deleting the old stuff out of the collection first. So in order to make this work correctly, I have to delete the documents that are already in the collection before I re-add them. Um, and we'll deal with that next time as well. So yeah, we're behind and that's completely my fault. And so I apologize. Um, using 3.12 was a bad idea. Um, so sorry about that. Um.